Welcome to this virtual Penguin talk on how publishing works and how you can get into publishing. Later on, we're gonna be answering as many of your questions as possible. So please submit them in the comment feed throughout the presentation. My name is Simon. I'm publicity manager at Penguin Random House Children, specializing in teen and primary fiction and nonfiction. And Penguin Random House is a global publisher and actually the biggest publisher in the world. There are over 10,000 people employed by PRH worldwide. 2,000 of which are located right here in the UK. And the rest of them, that's Canada, Spain, South Africa, South Africa, China, Australia, and New Zealand. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm an editorial assistant at Hamish Hamilton, and I work on a varied mixture of literary fiction and non-fiction books. At Penguin, we publish books for everyone, from classic children's books and audiobooks to the exciting new voices in fiction and non-fiction. Publishing is a thriving and exciting industry that is constantly fresh and changing. Many of our books take on new forms after their first life as a book. For example, our book Noughts and Crosses was recently turned into a TV show, which featured our brilliant collaborator, Stormzy. Making a book is an intricate process that requires a lot of teamwork, and the best kind of publishing feels like a relay race where each division plays an important part. It can take anywhere between six months to two years for a book to be published. But in special cases, the process can move a lot faster. Extinction Rebellion's book, This Is Not a Drill, had its artwork, editing, design, and production completed in just 10 days due to the time of the protests. So let's talk a bit about how to go about actually making a book. First of all, you have the author. Anyone can be an author. And at Penguin, we publish authors from all the different genres, including fiction, nonfiction, and children. Once they've started writing their book, the first thing they do is find a literary agent to represent them. The literary agent can be thought of as the middleman between authors and publishers. Literary agents have a wide network of contacts and relationships with acquisition editors at publishing houses. They know what the editors are looking for and they're experts at sending submissions to the right people. Authors will try to find a literary agent who likes their book and is willing to promote it and sell it on to editors. Then we have the contract and the rights team. When the publishing house agrees to take on the book or acquires it, a publishing contract will be drawn up. This contract is a legal document and it outlines all the important information about the deal, including copyright details, how much money the author gets as an advance and how much they will get in royalties each time the book is sold. And then we have the editor. When the publishing house agrees to take on a book or acquires it, it's the editor's job to make the manuscript the best it can be. They'll spend a lot of time on each book, reading parts of the manuscript, editing and suggesting changes, and they're always working on multiple books at once. I work in editorial and I absolutely love it. No day is the same in my job. One of the highlights of my job has been editorial working on Bernadine Evaristo's Girl, Woman, Other. It's such a special feeling seeing a book you've worked on and loved in private get into the hands of thousands of readers who connect with it too. One of the more challenging things about my job is coming to an agreement with an author about what changes we should make in the book as we can sometimes have different ideas about the direction it should go. But it feels like a real privilege to work back closely with an author on a project that they've pulled their full self into. Cool, and then we go on to design and production. So a design responsibility is to make the book look good. And that is both inside and out. That is about you know, briefing an illustrator for the cover, designing the cover, the spine, the back, how the text lays on the inside, how the illustrations work with the words. It's actually one of the most important parts of the publishing process because that finished product looking great is so important, which links in to the production team, whose job is to make all that amazing design work that looks beautiful on the screen look just as good, if not better, in your hands in the bookshop, making sure the colours pop, the finishes are right. Then we go on to marketing and publicity. I personally do publicity, and the difference between that and marketing is generally marketing is stuff that is paid for, so billboards, advertisement on TV, while publicity is more stuff that you get for free or for promo. So for example, if you see your favorite author on a TV show, listen to them on a podcast, read a review of theirs in a book, or see your favorite YouTuber or social media influencer talking about the book, that could be down to me as I've pitched out to those people, sold the book in, and got those people excited about the author and the book. Um, one of the favorite parts of my job is I get to work with debut authors, people who've maybe spent 10 years writing this book and have really wanted it to be talked about in the right way and getting their books reviewed, getting them to get write a piece in a publication they've loved for years is a really great feeling. 
The downside is actually quite small, but my job is also things like organizing schedules, booking hotels, organizing taxis, and probably every single moment of my career has been the most stressful, normally involves me, rain, a tired author, and a taxi that has never arrived. Then we move on to sales. So this is when this, this team goes to places like Waterstones, WH Smiths, supermarkets, schools, library, anywhere you can buy a book from, and they get those people excited about that book so that as many books are in that store as possible on publication day. And then we move on to distribution to retailers, which is actually a really important role because sometimes if all the clouds align, books can sell out, there can be a sudden spike, and those books can go out of stock, which means no one else can buy it. And it's a distribution team's responsibility to make sure the minute that a book goes out of stock in a store, the next day more copies arrive to keep the momentum going. So now we're going to move on to it's not just about the books, which I think is really important. Publishing is obviously a place of book lovers and people who engage with that, but there is so much more you can do. I think sometimes people feel that if they're not like the biggest book lover ever, they can't be part of publishing, which is simply not true. So, for example, you can work in brands. Penguin works with some massive brands like Jamie Oliver, Peppa Pig, Peter Rabbit. And this is more about making those kind of book characters extend outside the world of the book to things like creative partnerships, creative campaigns, getting branding, all this stuff that makes that book's character move outside that world. Then we have audiences, which is our team in charge of social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the Penguin website. Alongside this, they're responsible for making live experiences which make the book go outside that world yet again. So for example, we launched Murky Books, which is Stormzy's imprint at the Barbican, and Penguin Friday, which is a festival style event with live music, performance poetry, and a panel discussing and celebrating the LGBT community that happened during Pride Month. And finally, we have audio, which is actually a relatively new part of publishing, but an increasingly part, important part of the business as it sees massive growth year on year. Penguin Random House Audio is actually the UK's leading publisher of audiobooks. And since its launch, the team has won so many awards. And what is so great about this job is it's in terms of pairing those kind of amazing texts with readers that are perfectly suited, such as like Fleabag's Andrew Scott or the actor Michael Sheen, alongside producing original content such as the Penguin podcast. There's also many other areas of the business, some of which you might not already realise, but they're an important part of keeping the company going. We have the finance team to manage all the money that comes in and goes out of the business. We also have the technology team. Technology is absolutely vital to enabling our creativity. The team manages all our systems and all our services. Then we also have the distribution team, who Simon mentioned earlier. We have two distribution centres, one in Colchester and one in Grantham, that distribute more than 37 million books and more than 37,000 titles to our customers. So let's now talk a little bit more about the different routes for getting into publishing. One of the first routes is work experience. We offer around 450 work experience placements per year at our offices in central London. Each placement lasts for two weeks and most importantly is paid the national living wage. During the placement, you shadow a team, which could be editorial, sales, marketing or publicity and get to grips with day to day life at Penguin. Applications open every few months, so keep an eye on our website and our Facebook page. You must be 18 or over at the time of your placement. Fun fact, last year, 82 young people who did work experience with us secured paid roles afterwards. Another route into publishing is through um, signing up to internships. We offer 10-week internships in the summer across a wide range of departments. As part of this internship, you'll be given a real business problem to work on and be paid the London living wage. There are nine internships every year. Applications open in spring and will be advertised on our website and our social media channel. And then another very special thing we do is called the Scheme. The Scheme is our early career program. Our paid editorial traineeships are for six months and they're open to applications from people who are BAME or from a socioeconomically disadvantaged background. It's a chance to experience life in a publishing house, to find out what editor, editorial work is like and to build the basics you'll need to start a career in publishing. I actually started at Penguin Random House on the scheme and absolutely loved it. I still work with the same team today. I had no publishing experience before arriving, but had recently graduated from university. I was mentored and guided by the editors in my team and worked on lots of exciting projects, including Lady Smith's most recent book, Grand Union, Marlon James's Black Leopard, Red Wolf, 
I even had the chance to get involved in the publication of Michelle Obama's The Comic. We were also given structured workshops on the nuts and bolts of the job alongside working in our specific teams. I didn't live in London before I started the scheme, so I used the Spare Room Project, which finds free accommodation for publishing interns and also for people looking for work experience. I'd highly recommend it, even if you don't have any experience before applying. We also have entry level roles, uh, and you can keep an eye out for entry level roles as they come live on our careers website and social channels. We don't mind what you study at school or university, we're just looking for people with great ideas. And I think we have what you don't need to get into publishing. So the first one, which I think is really important, is a degree. You no longer need a degree to get into a job at Penguin Random House. That is not just a master's in publishing, that is any degree. You do not need one. Graduates are obviously still welcome to apply, but which university they attended, or if you attend university at all, will no longer have any impact on the candidate getting the job or not. Secondly, we have accommodation in London. So now we are working um, with the Square Room Project to make sure that all our interns have offer of free accommodation during their internship. Last year, we supported 122 people, and we also subsidize a flat year round for those work experience from outside London. And finally, a contact already in the business. Gone the days when you need to know someone to get into publishing. Although it never hurts to build your network and meet people in industries you want to work in, you don't need to know someone to get your foot in the door as we don't accept personal referrals from our work experience placements or jobs. And now what it helps to have. So the first is communication skills, which actually I do think is a really scary word. And when I first started in publishing and I saw it on every kind of job advert, every time of like kind of like recruitment, to, it really scared me. And it doesn't mean you need to know certain terminologies or speak in a certain way. It just basically means doing what you all do now, I'm sure, of your friends and your family and where you work now, which is just engaging with people, listening to them and showing passion and commitment to learning more. And that is what it means by communication skills, nothing else. Second, um, we have kind of passion and curiosity, which links back to the first one. You know, when I first started working in publishing, I had no real understanding of the ins and outs, you know, the departments. I just loved books and wanted to get involved. And actually, I think it's really good to ask questions, kind of engage with the people you're working with and show that passion and actually not be scared to, because actually it makes you look better and more engaged. And the final one is kind of, um, I guess kind of people skills. And I think this really can apply to so many parts of your life. If it be a summer job, a Saturday job, kind of any volunteering you do, any kind of clubs you're part of. It's just about knowing people, knowing how they react to stuff. And actually, I think sometimes those things, those everyday experiences we all have, are just as important, if not more, than if you run a blog or kind of like are very involved in literary scene, because a lot of people can't be. And it's not making those experiences less valuable, but actually more valuable to us as a company and to you as a candidate. Absolutely. Um, I just want to also reiterate what Simon was saying about how when you first uh, looking into applying, it can feel really scary and feel like you don't maybe don't have the experience they're looking for. But it is very likely that in any jobs or groups or societies you've been part of, you've already used and learned how to use all of these skills that they're looking for. So it's always, always worth backing that you'll already have the skills that they need. Um, I can see also that as we've been talking, you've been sending in your questions, um, which is really great to see. Um, I also had a lot of questions before I started, um, and we're here to try and bust any of the myths that you might have heard and give you an insight into our work. Um, thank you um, for watching the virtual Penguin Talk on how to get into publishing. Make sure you subscribe to the Penguin Platform channel for books, chat and giveaways for all Penguin teen and young adult books. And finally, please fill in the short feedback survey, link for which is in the description below for a copy of these slides. So now we're just going to head over to some of the questions that you've been um, asking. Uh, so the first question is, um, what happened to the scheme internships and work experience this year? I don't know if you'd be able to answer that one, Simon. Um, I guess, um, I think, because you've been on the scheme for maybe it's best for you to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. We've had to make the difficult decision um, to pause both the scheme and internships this year, um, as both programmes relied on us being on site and in the office. 
uh, work experience is paused, but we're currently working on ways to run internships, the scheme and work experience in our new normal. So watch this space is all I can say for now. Um, and then you've kind of answered this one already, Simon, but do you need a master's in publishing to work in uh, publishing? I mean, the short answer <laughs> is no. Basically, I've not got a master's in publishing. A lot of people I work for, I don't. That's not to say if you're currently on a master's in publishing, that is a total waste of endeavor. It's incredibly useful. I think as we're getting to, there are so many different ways and different skill sets to get into publishing. And I think the key is to not think any one of them is the only way. There are many ways to do it. And yes, mm. a, master's in, a master's in publishing is one of many, and it is not essential. Mm. Um, so one for you, Hannah. How can I make my CV stand out so that hiring managers notice it? That's a really good question. Hiring managers do get a lot of CVs. Um, and one thing, um, often there's also um, a cover letter needed with a CV, this might be different for different jobs, but for a cover letter, I would always make sure that you um, make sure you specifically talk about the imprint or division you're applying to and maybe mention some books by them that you've enjoyed. Um, and also you can talk a bit more generally about Penguin and why you specifically love Penguin as a company if you're applying to Penguin, say. Um, it just really highlights to hiring managers that you've kind of done your research and you know a bit about your role. Um, and then also with your CV, um, so some of the skills we've already mentioned, so like communication skills, people skills, it's really good to, to draw that out um, and kind of make it really clear to the hiring manager that you already have that experience and also make it clear that you're really willing to learn and willing to grow in whatever um, role that you're applying for. And Simon, who's your favourite author that you've worked with? Oh, oh God, I hope. I hope, I hope. <laughs> Um, my favourite is probably actually um, a curve model and writer and activist called Charlie Howard, who wrote a very personal memoir about her kind of fight with kind of eating disorders and body issues. I think what I loved about her is she had such a kind of clear message and such like an important one. And she was incredibly to work with, incredibly collaborative. And I feel that, you know, we really achieved what she wanted to achieve. And I think she does such an amazing work ethic and such an empathy that I always hold that campaign very close to me because of that. Mm. Um, Hannah, here's one for you, um, which we kind of touched upon in the um, kind of um, presentation already, but do you have to live in London to work for Penguin? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, with regards to entry level roles, so kind of talking about work experience, internship in the scheme, um, as I kind of mentioned before, I didn't live in London before starting working in publishing uh, and I was able to find accommodation while I was on those sort of shorter term um, contracts. But then I did move down to London when I moved into my editorial assistant job. Um, and the, our main offices are in London, although we do also have an office in Dublin. So if you're um, watching from Ireland, there is also somewhere that you can apply there. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to have already lived in London, um, but then most of the jobs in Penguin are in central London. And um, Simon, how many books do you have to read in your job and do you need to be able to read fast? It's a really good question actually, <laughs> especially because kind of growing up I was by no means the fastest reader, I was not in the top sets of English and actually that was something when I entered the industry that I was really concerned about, that I'd be surrounded by people who are kind of whizzing through stuff and engaging it really fast and I wouldn't be able to keep up. And I think there's lots of different ways in publishing to kind of do your job well. So I tend, for example, ask for manuscripts earlier. I ask for synopsis. And I kind of very much kind of don't feel pressure to kind of be reading everything that's being published and everything that's going on right now. And kind of not to beat myself up for that, because I, that is not the yardstick that I put to my job. It's about, you know, kind of reading the books I need to read, understanding them and kind of PR them correctly. It's not about reading every bestseller that comes out. And you don't need to put your pressure on that self in this job. Uh, um, so for you, Hannah, why did you decide to join the industry? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think, like many of you, if you're also watching after having just graduated or having just left school, I really had no idea what I wanted to do next. I'd studied English language and literature. Um, so I spent most of my three years at uni reading um, and a lot of the skills that I learnt there. So um, writing essays on books is quite similar to a part of my job now, which is um, where I have to write up reports on books for more senior editors. Um, reading and digesting a lot and then having, you know, creative um, conversations uh, and like bouncing off um, other people about a book is it something else that's really part of my job now that I did loads at university. So when the scheme um, placement came up and I saw the opportunity, 
so much of what they were talking about was stuff I'd already done and knew that I loved and then so much of it was stuff that I hadn't done but was very excited at the thought of doing um so I'm very passionate about um debut authors um and kind of increasing uh the representation of people that we're publishing so it's really really like amazing to get to work with um, new authors kind of like Simon was saying before and like bringing new voices into the industry um, and seeing that um, kind of move from something that you're working on privately to something that thousands of people are reading. Um, so yeah it kind of the industry really matched stuff that I knew I was passionate about and then also I just really felt like I was going to be able to learn a lot in my job and also get to be really creative which were two things that were really important to me. Um, so yeah I think that would be um, yeah, those are my main reasons. How about you? What was your main reason for deciding to join the industry? Um, well, I think I was that kind of classic kid who kind of was like always reading books, always on a holiday. Like mm. I wasn't very sporty, which I'm sure is shocking to many people. I know I was not very loud as a child. I was quite an introvert. And I think books from a really early age were kind of like a safety blanket and a refuge for me. And I think then obviously I kind of did my degrees, kind of did a lot of odd jobs. And I kind of interned actually my first job at Harper Collins and I just kind of felt very kind of welcomed very safe and I think it was just being able to work with something I loved and I think you know both my parents never had the opportunity to do jobs they loved or to be passionate about so I think just being in a work environment where everyone is passionate about their work wants to discuss it and are proud to discuss it was such an alien concept to me that when I kind of discovered you could do that and that could be a path for me mm. I just kind of never really wanted to leave really after that Mm. Um, so Hannah, how do, I guess there's a question from someone, a question from someone, so this is not me, it is them, how do I know what kind of role I would be interested in if I love books? That's a really brilliant question because I think as we outlined earlier, there's a few roles that are a bit more um, well known and heard of kind of outside of the industry. So you probably have heard of an editor before, have heard of a sales team, but you might not have heard of a production team or the distribution team. Um, so I think the first step would definitely be, be to kind of have a look through have a look through these slides for one thing which will give you the link at the end and then also if you have a look on jobs boards they'll show you all the different um divisions that are hiring all the different departments and tell you a little bit more about what those roles will look like um, and so i'd highly recommend having a look there and then seeing if anything um particularly kind of catches your eye already feeds into something that you really are interested in care about a lot but also like might be something you've never heard of and just sounds like an exciting new challenge um, for me, I think I knew that I was very passionate about um, working kind of one on one with people. And that's like quite a big part of um, the editorial role. Like you work kind of one on one with agents, one on one with authors. But then you do also get to um, work in a team with the rest of your division. Um, and kind of moving between those two roles is something that I really, really love. And kind of is how I knew that editorial was a place for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a huge, huge um, difference. And yeah, I think. You might also be working in another industry or looking at another industry that has very transferable um, skills into publishing. So it, also, if you were working in publicity, say, in a different industry um, and then watch this talk or heard a bit more about publishing, that's something that you could transfer over and that kind of be part of publishing too. Um, yeah, what would your advice be on that? I think so much. I mean, definitely, I think the first thing is, is don't think you have to decide now or to decide before you approach the industry. I, like a lot of people, kind of only really knew what an editor was. That was like the only role I really thought involved books. So naturally, yeah. that was my first port of call. And actually, through some internships and working experiences I got, it was all in PR and marketing, which I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, and I think it's amazing how, you know, so many people in publishing do start off kind of wanting to be the editor. And then when they do experience other roles, it would be sales or marketing or production or design, you suddenly do realize that maybe your skills are better suited to those roles, or actually you can still be involved in the way you want to be in a book, if even if you're not specifically editing them. And I'd kind of say, you know, it, it's kind of, I think a lot about is not putting the pressure on yourself or kind of feeling you have to decide so quick. I've got friends who, the first couple of years in their job, they were kind of like in a different team and they moved over or like you can kind of say with a different industry, then left and came back. And I think, you know, sometimes we want so much to find what we do and what we love. We kind of almost pigeonhole ourselves. And I would just say that if you love books and enjoy working with books, that is that is true of every department in Penguin and in every publisher. And don't kind of feel it's like an editor or nothing and feel free to explore and say, and I guess also on the flip side, like, you know, 
work out what you do and don't like. So, you know, maybe you try a department, it's not for you, you move to another and vice versa. Basically just stay open and don't feel limited by if you change your mind as you go on your journey into publishing. Um, that's a, really that's a good, good one for you, actually. How does a writer get an agent? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question also. Um, so there's a couple of ways. Um, the main way would be if you've written, as a writer, if you've written a submission or if you've written a manuscript or just like part of a manuscript even, uh, and you're interested in getting representation, you can search for agents online um, and they should have all of their details and they'll explain which agencies and which agents in particular are looking for different kinds of um, books. So some will be, you know, exclusively nonfiction, some might be exclusively fiction, some might be literary fiction, some might be a bit more commercial. Um, and so you can find kind of the agents that already work with the authors whose work you think is quite similar to yours. And I would recommend um, that you send it to them um, only and try not to send it to, to people who maybe don't work exactly in the um, area that you're writing in. Um, and then it's the agent who will decide um, whether to take on a writer. And like I said, sometimes that will be from a full submission, um, a full manuscript. Sometimes that will just be from a part manuscript. Um, sometimes as well, agents will go to like writer showcases and, and find writers there. Or if you've entered into a competition um, and you do really well and your, your name's kind of published online somewhere, they might also reach out to you. Um, but yeah, often writers are quite proactive in sending their work to an agent. Um, and then I have a question for you. So uh, what activities could under 18s do to show passion for publishing on your CV? That's a really actually great question. And I want to try to answer that kind of thing to what I said earlier, that once again, mm -hmm. you know, don't kind of feel that, you know, because a lot of people, you know, for example, a lot of people do blogs or kind of bookstagramming, but not everyone has time for that. And I think just don't feel that unless you have these very kind of visible book loving things, if you're lucky enough to, you know, work at a big literary festival or lucky enough to have the time to kind of create a blog or work for Waterstones, that if you don't have that experience, it's not, then you can't get into publishing because that's simply not true. You know, ultimately, you know, I've got friends who, you know, for example, couldn't work in Waterstones, so like volunteer at a local charity shop and a lot about their cover letter was about kind of seeing what people were buying secondhand. Or for example, even just kind of following the publishing industry, as Hannah said earlier, kind of reading places like the bookseller, reading what's been reviewed and like showing that, you know, you're kind of immersed in that world and you understand it is enough and I think also similarly don't feel your CV has to be blocked around kind of very kind of classically publishing kind of extracurricular activities you know do put in stuff about where you work if you manage people if you're a team player if you kind of what challenges you face balancing your professional and personal life and feel that those are just as valid and not that if your book if your CV isn't chock a block with kind of festivals bookshop blogs that you're kind of a less viable candidate because we do completely get that, you know, when you are studying, working a full time job, you know, there's not the time to do these things. So I think, mm. yes, I would recommend doing those things, but don't feel they're essential and don't feel because you don't do them, you shouldn't apply to work in publishing. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I would say, just as you said, one of the most important things is how you work with other people and that you have some kind of self awareness of your. Um, style of working on your own and working in a team um, and that is so so important because when people are hiring they're looking for someone that they want to be able to work with and feel mm -hmm. that they'll be able to bounce ideas off with and collaborate with um, and you can show that in any kind of teamwork situation you've been in even if that's just like you've worked in a team at school or you're like on a team at school like it does, also doesn't have to be stuff that's outside of school necessarily because as Simon says we know not everyone has access to that has the time or you know kind of has the inclination really at that time um, so yeah, I want to really uh, hammer home that point as well. Um, and then I have a question here about um, how to get into design and illustration. Um, so kind of thinking about what are useful skills to have for these roles. Um, I don't know if you want to answer that one or I can. I can, I can. I mean, I must admit, I don't want to come to because obviously I don't work in design or illustration. I don't want to put something out of the world that's not true. But I think, you know, ultimately design, I think probably is still a little bit more of a technical kind of um, vocation in publishing, you know, compared to like PR and marketing, for example, where, you know, not many people have PR or marketing degrees in publishing, but I think design is still in terms of like, you know, knowing how to use certain software, how to work with stuff in space, you know, 
degrees, I would say, are still a bit more common, if not essential. And I think if you're not going down that route, I think things like creating your portfolio, kind of maybe kind of seeing if you can get your illustrations put up on your blog or other people's blogs. So I think that would be the kind of two routes is really yeah. kind of like a degree or if not kind of putting your work out there. And I think one of the great things about kind of Instagram and kind of Twitter and this kind of social media you live in is people's work can get exposure and can get accreditation without those traditional forms. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. I think there's also a um, a prize that we do at um, Penguin where you can submit your kind of version of a book cover. Um, so, and that's something that you could also be doing in your spare time if you if you wanted to, like kind of just like imagining and thinking about how you might design a the cover of a book that you really love, just to kind of exercise those um, skills and kind of translating um, a book into a cover like that. Cool. Um, and the next question is, do you need to be 18 to get published? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, there's, we have quite a few other support schemes as well, which are part of um, Penguin. So one of them is um, Murky Books, who do the New Writers Prize. Um, and that is open to anyone who's over 16. Um, so that happens. Um, we have one that happened this year and you could submit um, lots of different genres and then uh, there was like a judging panel who judged them all and then the winner received some support from Penguin and some exposure um, and that's a really you know brilliant route into um, being published for, for those people who've won um, so no the answer is no that's just an example of one of the ways but if you're under 18 you can be supported into being published as well um, and then just got a few more questions so um, kind of following on from what I was saying about how some things have been paused because of COVID, um, will there be more opportunities at Penguin soon? I've noticed less opportunities available during COVID. Um, so yeah, I think when we all moved to working from home and we all took a pause in our current hiring where we kind of sorted out this kind of brave new world we live in, however, roles are now opening up again and we hope these increases move forward and we get used to the new normal we live in. And we are going to be supporting people through the virtual interview process while we're not in the office. So we're still going to make sure that you are prepared and kind of comfortable as possible, even whilst we're recruiting in a new way. And just see if there's any more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, hi, here's one from you. As a person of colour, I worry about how non-diverse publishing can be. How have your experiences in the industry been, Hannah? Yeah, I'm really glad someone asked this question because I think yeah, clearly, like publishing does have quite a non-diverse um, kind of look to people who are outside of the industry and also in the industry. Like it is very clear that um, it's it's kind of new that um, more diverse voices and more diverse people are moving their way through the industry. Um, as I mentioned before, I came in on the scheme, which meant that um, there were there was me and nine other people who'd come from the same kind of background as me, who all joined at the same time. And most of us are still working at Penguin now. And um, it was honestly really like amazing to have that support network from so early on of other people of color working in the industry. And then also at the time I joined, um, Penguin started their group that was called Colorful, which is for um, all people of color in the industry. And so we can meet up monthly and kind of talk about, um, just we have like socials where it's just about building your network, but then also like kind of talk about anything that's troubling us or worrying us about being a person of color in the industry. Um, Penguin also just released their kind of inclusion um, accelerated program um, yesterday uh, and you know they're, they're taking loads of steps towards it not being um, as kind of undiverse situation as it is now but also like I'm not going to pretend that it's not um, an industry that is still quite traditional and there are still a lot of white people working in the industry and there's, there's far less of us um, also that's why we need you and that's why um, you know, I would really encourage you to apply because your voices are like so, so needed. Um, and yeah, you would definitely have a support network as soon as you came. Um, yeah, so what's a typical day in the life of a marketing assistant? I know that's a few years ago for you now, but. <laughs> Still burned <laughs> onto my mind. Um, I think what's actually interesting, go back to my first point actually about how you learn kind of actually the ins and out of publishing through osmosis. And I think that's the thing is like when I started as a marketing assistant, it's actually, I would probably say compared to my degree, actually my jobs and my Saturday jobs was actually where I had the most useful experience because I was 
organizing schedules, booking rooms, doing kind of admin like budgets, Excel spreadsheets. And actually what's so great about it is those skills you have from every walk of your life and then actually through the first couple of years being a marketing or publicity assistant that's when you sit in on meetings and you kind of learn the process you know i remember sitting in meetings and being like oh that's what production is oh that's what sales is oh that's what that does and actually kind of learning as i went so i would say that actually an editorial marketing assistant their day-to-day -day life is probably not so far removed if you have a saturday job or you can kind of help out. It's very kind of admin, communication, sorting out diaries, sorting out meeting rooms, kind of ordering stuff for events, kind of making sure that, that press lists are up to date. You know, I'd say it's very admin, very about, about learning the skills. So when you do reach the next level, that industry knowledge has kind of been absorbed by you through being an assistant. Yeah, that's very true. There's a lot of multitasking, especially at the beginning, <laughs> like, when you say a typical day, that's very hard to describe. Yes, no, most definitely. Very different. <laughs> um, here's one for you is, do you think publishing is future-proof as an industry or is it dying? Which is a, <laughs> a bold question. A loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I mean, it's always going to be very difficult to, to tell. I don't think any of us would have predicted mm. that 2020 was going to happen, for instance. <laughs> Um, but I know um, that there was a bit of worry um, maybe a decade ago now, kind of when ebooks started to become, to become much more popular, um, that people would just completely stop reading physical books and how would our industry survive? And obviously we're still here and very much thriving. Um, so I think that's quite an like good indicator of, of where we are. Um, and I'd say overall publishing is like definitely in good health. Um, and especially, as Simon mentioned earlier, the audio team is growing up. An unbelievable rate it's actually been so interesting to see how many more people are listening to audiobooks and, and using that as a way um, um, of reading uh, in kind of the last year or so so yeah there's like real um, areas of acceleration which is very exciting yeah um oh this is a good question mm -hmm. uh how can you get out of the cycle of unpaid internships Cool. Well, I guess there's two points to answer that question. I think the first is for PRH specifically, we only offer paid internships and work experience at the living wage. That's great. And that's something that's coming very recently and wasn't the case when I started looking. I would say another point in terms of this cycle of internship, which I think is like a very true kind of point. And I have met lots of interns who are very demoralized by kind of they're going around to all these different publishers and this kind of rotation. And I would say two things I think is really important is one kind of like get what you can out of it. So, for example, you know, if you're interning, and you've done an amazing job, you know, do talk to people, do ask them for kind of like a line or two of recommendation, do ask them if they know other people in the industry, do know them where they can go next. And I think always remember that you doing an internship for us is as much for us as it is for you. You're doing important tasks that we can't do ourselves. So do not be afraid to ask for any help you can get. Mm. And I think secondly, it's kind of like, you know, see, I remember when I was in my first internship, someone said to me we of being like, this is like a two week interview for you. This is like, the mo you'll never get an opportunity to work alongside people for two weeks and show them everything you do. Mm. I know that can be so difficult where you're having these like rotation of internships, nothing's happening, but don't be demoralized. Go in there every time being like, I'm going to prove every day that they'd be crazy to not hire me. Not just that, that you know, someone will suddenly come in and be like, you are so amazing, please stay. But people remember the good interns. They remember the people who push the boat out. And I would just say like rinse every opportunity of internships and do not be scared to show that you want a job in publishing and you want more opportunities. And neither undervalue yourself to believe that you are not worthy to ask those questions because you are. Yeah, that's a really great point. And that about valuing yourself as well, like you deserve to get paid, like that mm -hmm. is an absolute, um, which is why all of us are paid, but mm -hmm. if you have found yourself in a cycle, like, yeah, you can't forget that you absolutely deserve to be paid and you deserve to get onto the next stage of your career. Um, this is one for you again, uh, Simon. What's the difference between marketing and publicity? Uh, could you give us some more examples? Cool. Yes, I mean, it's the, the, I think what's interesting is kind of like as publishing evolves and kind of becomes more multifaceted, I'd say the lines blur more and more. And actually, what's quite nice now is our, my PR colleagues and our marketing counterparts do collaborate more and more and more. For example, social media, you know, when there are kind of like paid and not paid for partnerships, that, that now is something we kind of do together. 
as I kind of said, and it's not a universal rule, but I think it is the kind of thing where if you're paying for it, it's marketing. If you're not paying for it, it's PR. So for example, if you have a billboard in Trafalgar Square, you're paying for that. You know, if you're running an advert in a magazine, you're paying for that. However, if I pitch an author, so go to an editor and say, would you really love to interview Jacqueline Wilson, John Green, whoever, and I kind of convince them there's a story there, and they do the interview with Jackie or John, whoever, then that's free. I'm not paying for that coverage. I'm not paying for that exposure. Similarly, if you get someone on Graham Norton or Jonathan Ross or This Morning, similarly, we're not paying for people to go on those shows. We're not using budget. We're kind of going in there and negotiating, having them on for free. And I think that's what's kind of interesting about marketing and PR is they're both very different but equally complex kind of disciplines because with the money you put in, there's risk because the more money you put into a book, the more profit you need to make. And similarly with PR, it's difficult because actually with no money on offer, they can just tell me no, as they often do over and over again. And so that would probably be the most distinctive difference. Um, sorry, it's going down to the questions. For you, Hannah, how much do you earn in publishing? Yeah, so I can um, talk about entry level pay here. Um, so I'm in an assistant job at the moment um, and our entry level pay is £24,000 a year. Um, and then this increases by £1,000 each year for your first two uh, years in the role. Um, so that's what it's like at Penguin and um, it can be different in different uh, publishing houses. I will say that um, as a industry that's primarily London centric, um, those salaries are lower than some of the other um, graduate schemes that you might be applying for in mm -hmm. London. Um, and that's just something to take into consideration when you're thinking about the industry. Um, okay, so one last question. Uh, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to someone looking to get into the industry? Thanks. I would also love your thoughts on this afterwards because I feel I am kind mm. of repeating myself and banging the same drum. I think, you know, not to be too kind of like RuPaul about it or whatever, like I think that believe that you belong in this industry and believe that you can contribute. And I think definitely like so many people I've worked in terms of interns, you know, they're almost as inbuilt. And maybe that's our fault as an industry of kind of like feeling that, you know, they don't deserve to be there or they've got to prove to us that we want them. And it is a mutual thing. And I would say definitely when it comes to publishing in particular is that, you know, I can go through all the kind of classic this, like, you know, kind of like research, invest in searching for a job you know kind of know what publishing houses are doing do internships you can't do internships work at a bookshop you can't work at a bookshop kind of work in a charity shop and look at books you know there's all these kind of routes down to it but i think the main thing is like at any one point it's a relationship you know the industry deserves to make you want them as much as they make you want them so keep that balance level and if at any point if it be as kind of how attached on the salary or whatever if any aspect you feel actually you know what this isn't quite fit for me this is not maybe what i want is don't be afraid to either ask for it or be like well you know what then then that's not a deal i want to take part in i really do think that you know as i touched on we do want you and we need to make publishing more diverse and we need to make it more open and you know you guys are bringing something to us so have that confidence and belief if that is not mm. too massively cliche <laughs> No, that was absolutely brilliant. That, yeah, that is such such an important point. And definitely, I think if you take anything away from this talk, like that should be the thing that you take away. Um, I would also say uh, something that I would maybe advise is just to stay really, really curious and passionate about all the stuff that you're already curious and passionate about. Um, because it's an industry and a job that um, takes inspiration from so many different um, places and needs very, very varied voices and varied interests to thrive um, and to continue um, being creative and being accessible um, and being what our readers want to read. Um, and so, yeah, whatever interests you already have, just absolutely like lean into them, um, spend, spend time learning more about the stuff that you care about and, and are excited about. Um, and those experiences you already have mm. um, will bring so much um, to uh, any role that you have in the industry. Yeah. Exactly, don't think you need to fit a mold which I think when I first started publishing, I felt that I needed to look a certain way, talk a certain way, like not wear nail polish, like, you know, and I think that it's a long time to realize that, you know, that's because publishing is so varied and there's so many influences that actually you bringing your authentic self 
is so much better than bringing what you think people want from you. And I wish I knew that right at the beginning rather than seven years in. <laughs> that's a really, really great point. Um, sadly, that's all we have time for now. Um, if you're completing the activity sheet, the colour of the talk is light blue. And if you want to have a copy of these slides and to have a say in the future of the Penguin Talk programme, please fill in the short feedback survey, the link for which is in the comments in the description below. Thank you so much for watching.